Earl Grey, and you're listening to the Movie Raid Show. It's time for the Movie Raid, and tonight's victim is actor Earl Grey that is played in Tolman and Beloved Beast, directed by Jonathan Holbrook. Hello. Hey, how you doing? I'm going to try to stay cool, try to be alive here. So, having to be in part both these films by Jonathan Holbrook, and, and it's, so far it's trailblazing, and we're getting down with Beloved Beast as a special on this particular day. Beloved Beast is an amazing film. I had a fantastic time doing it. It's out now. It's been a while getting there, so we're we're all really excited. The whole cast, crew, everybody is pretty excited about it. Hit the streets. Yeah, and it had some trouble trying to get distributed in some ways. I, how long did it take to, like, it took up until now, but how long has it been actually been in limbo in terms of actually being out there for the public? It actually, we made uh, arrangements uh, with IndyCan and for distribution and all that, and that actually went very smoothly. What we had to do is do all the quality control, go through the process to make sure that there wasn't anybody's logos and, and all that, and, and, you know, get everything signed off. So there was a process we had to go through to get all that and all the things you have to do to get subtitles in a bunch of languages because it's worldwide. Kind of marched through all that stuff and uh, got it out. It actually, believe it or not, is out a little bit earlier than it was planned because uh, in October we're having the premiere in theater in Hollywood. And so it, it came out on VOD a little earlier than, the, than it was supposed to. But all is good. Is this actually going to be in a, sol- a couple of selected theaters, or is this like within particular state, or are we going to like? Is this actually going to hit worldwide in uh, in the next couple months or so? It's to be determined. What we're starting off is uh, in theaters in Hollywood, very limited release. Going to see how that goes. They're literally going to check that out and see what the uh, response is and then make a determination with us after that as to what other theaters we may hit across the country. It may hit up to five theaters, but we're all going to sit down and uh, check that out when we get done with Hollywood. Very nice, very nice, and, and hopefully it goes even further than that. But in terms of like where the locations are during of this film, was this actually one spot, or did you actually have to bounce from uh, different locations, even through other states, to uh, get the atmosphere of Beloved Beast? Well, it all actually takes place in a place in another dimension called Slew Town. <laughs> but seriously, the film was shot throughout Washington State, and if you've ever been to Washington State, uh, it's about north to south if you're driving about four hours from north to south and we pretty much filmed from north to south used to know the number and i forgot now but i think it's like uh, 17 18 different locations we had had a whole bunch of locations and we hit them all so a bunch of places throughout washington oh very nice well, were you able to get that down pat was it pretty easy for you or did you have to actually get special permission for some of these places it was a combination so we had to get permission in some of these places and then we shot in you know various houses and things like that so you know everything had some level of permission whether it's you know municipal or police or somebody's home there was one home that we shot in in everett that actually a number of scenes took place in uh night and day and and, and it was literally over months uh, that we we were using this location and, and the poor couple who lent us their house you know we were taking over their house for days on end over and over again but but they suffered through it and uh, it was critical to the feel of the movie a lot of jonathan's movies the whole universe we call it of slew town it's you'd have to watch the movies whether it be tall men or love of beast but it's about a feel it's not a particular time it feels like the 70s or 80s but it isn't necessarily it doesn't have cell phones but it has some new cars but it all has a particular feel that's not right and you know that much and so every prop every location every actor every performance uh, has to reflect that in order to keep the universe together and so all of these locations we were at were kind of critical to making the Slew Town universe. Now the story itself, I mean, it is 
timeless like one of those timeless films that uh, that you just mentioned that it, you don't know where it's at particularly or, or where where exactly it's at you don't know if you just like you said you just have that feeling you just get that kind of weird vibe that something might be happening or you just think that it's progressing and, and so forth but having to develop the story that uh, that is a little bit of awkward a little distraught within the characterization was it really difficult to actually tone the the locations with to incorporate with the story of having to tie it with it was it having to get the tone down and having to have, have actually match this kind of uh, story with it hopefully you watch the movie and you get this eerie feeling even when nothing is substantially happening in that very moment in time and to get that it is not a simple thing to get that is requires everything from a location to everything on the set there isn't a, a piece of art hanging on the wall. There isn't a piece of furniture in a house. There isn't a piece of clothing. There isn't a performance uh, by any of the actors that isn't purpose-built towards building that odd feel. Now, having to perform in this film yourself, you also play an interesting role as well in having to uh, ex extend that within the universe of this film. Can you tell us a little bit your involvement of how you actually wanted to do the role and in what, what the actual significance is in this f particular film? Oh, uh, well, so Jonathan Holbrook, myself, and a guy named Dave Schechter, uh, we are together, we are Chronicle Factory. And we've been actually working together for quite some time now. Early on, I played a character named Johnny Rocketfield for Jonathan in a short called Whiskers. It's out there if you want to see it. Johnny Rocketfield was a very enthusiastic salesman. So as time went on, I told Jonathan that I wanted to play a bad guy. So he wrote this part me in mind. And the character that I play in Beloved Beast Ash. He is the local drug dealer. Pretty much everything bad. He's done it. And not to give too much away, but starts dabbling in human trafficking in this film. So there's not very much redeeming about Ash. So I really reveled in that character. The one thing, though, with the entire universe of Town is it's all slow burn. So everything is dialed down about 10 notches, and, and that very much includes Ash. So a lot of what comes out of Ash is uh, a twitch here and an interpretation there, but uh, he, is, he is not a nice guy. Now, was there ever any kind of doubts or any kind of concern whether this character should be any connection with any other characters in this movie at all? Or do you think this should have been a better, more of a standout or or, any, or anything else related to that? No, I mean, I had a really good idea of who Ash was. One of, I, I just my particular way of doing things, of training, for acting is I either have to know or build a backstory or the person I am, because as they all say, you know, acting is really being, so to be this person, I need to know who this person is. And so Ash is basically given up completely. He would probably kill himself if it wasn't so much work. And he's divorced. He has kids but never sees them. He lives alone. He's done every kind of crime possible. He's really a loner. He has no friends. He has nobody he trusts. And so he's pretty much hollow. <laughs> and hopefully you see that in the character coming through. He's pretty much used up, seen it all, been there, done that, and is very jaded on life in general. And so no connections to anyone unless there's something in it for him. And I noticed there's a, a very small hint of sympathy in a way. There is a particular scene in this film, which I'm not going to give away. There is a particular scene that uh, I've noticed that this character has a small hint of some kind of sympathy. Because we notice that Ash does have some kind of emotion, but it's very hard to actually penetrate that. Because here's a guy that, like you said, has been through it all, and he's into everything, everything bad, and so forth. But we see that a little, at least a little, a little hint of, of each character in this movie, including this one, that something was going on in their past or there's something they're, they're still trying to figure out in their current state. I'm glad you noticed that. Uh, I'm very happy 
that you notice that. Again, see, Ash has kids. He doesn't see them, but he has them. And so that is his empathy that he thinks, and again, not to get the way away the movie, but in the position, in the situation he's in, he has a twinge there because he also has a child. He can have a little bit of empathy there. And it doesn't stop him from doing what he's doing, but he feels it just a little. Yeah, and, and some of the, some of a little bit a little bit of that struggle going on, but having to work with you know children in in this type of film, was there ever any kind of any restrictions or any kind of specific rules? Because you know, Sanaya, I, I I can't remember how old she was in this movie, but having to work with a, a child and and certain things, uh, usually there's you some rules, but was there anything special that you had to a uh, bid in order to continue filming? Jonathan runs a really really professional set and as usual you know he did that here for him it's all about communication Sanaya's parents either one or both were there all the time and so communication from Jonathan both with Sanaya and also with her parents before during and even after was constant so that everybody knows what we're doing why we're doing it etc it's interesting you know making this film if you look closely that the scenes that Samaya is in a lot of the stuff that, that Jonathan builds as far as violence and things like that it's a lot of it's implied you know there, there's something that happens but you don't see it and then you see the the results of it and, and all that. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, carnage that happens, but obviously Sanaya wasn't in, involved in that. And again, in reality, that's all makeup and things like that. So I know when he's there, but, you know, as far as what was going on with Sanaya, John was constant communication with her and her parents the whole time. Well, that's great because it's like it's really hard uh, in terms of having to work within this kind of environment especially this is a different kind of storytelling this isn't a uh, you know point a point b point e and so forth this is the kind of storytelling that a little bit of a, a fantasy in its own way but it's kind of a twisted fantasy it's almost a little eclectic of a, of a story and i mean this in a positive way because it's going different directions or a direction of your own to the viewer trying to figure out you know exactly the the, the main part of the story but but as, as for why or how of this part of the story, that's up to you in terms of between the middle and the end especially. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely love that about this movie in that there are a lot of parallel stories going on. The movie was very ambitious in that way. If you think about it, a, a very large ensemble cast, a lot of sets, you know, a lot of locations. And the story uh, required that because it's a lot of different stories. Everybody's got their own story happening. Ash has got his stories. She's got hers. Everyone's got a story and they all come slamming together, you know, in different parts. And, and I just love the way that that's written and, and came together in the film. That's one of the things that was really attractive to me about this. What was the biggest concerns in terms of writing out this particular story especially this is a, a slow burner this is a kind of uh, it's not exactly violent in its own way but it's a it's a thinker it's it's a type that you have to read these characters in, in your own way to figure out where they're going what what they are what kind of uh, history that they have but it's not blatantly in your face but having to corporate this to show that how can you really piece this together to where the audience can understand but also leave some fun mystery to it I didn't have concerns about that. I mean, I obviously I know the writer and I know the director very well. So I had complete confidence in, in that aspect of it. And once the cast is decided, you know, it's, it's a fantastic cast, all of which I know, you know, uh, or got to know, but most of which I knew in the beginning. So I had complete confidence there. The one worry I say I would have was that it was such an ambitious film that the length of the movie, the length of the movie was what was required, you know, to, to be able to tell the movie. And we filmed this movie over almost exactly one year. Continuity, things like that, you know, that everything, you know, from the obvious haircuts and, and wardrobe and, and things like that, but just keeping the story together over a year and just the sheer and ambition of getting it all done and put together. I mean, I know once we get everything we can, so to speak, that we can make it all happen. And we were plodding along, you know, without 
install at all. So I didn't really have any problem there, but it's just a lot to, you know, a lot to bite off credit to everyone involved. They just plowed through it and got it done. And, you know, over, like I said, a, a complete year. Long time on a project, but it was worth it. I and mean, this film is not a traditional film at all. When, when you guys see this movie, this movie is, is very different. This movie is something that uh, you can have a, actually a new experience with in terms of almost how to deal with your own emotions in some ways if you really want to go deeper than that but having to uh, have these concerns was there ever any doubts or anything related to that in terms of if this is going to be a mainstream or in terms of what what type of film this is going to be even though you guys know what type of movie you want it to be but and how is it going to be transformed into once this gets out a big worry for me was that all along the way Jonathan works is that we're seeing trailers and things like that constantly, uh, almost like daily. So we're seeing everything that's happening as as it's happening, and a lot of the movie was shot out of order, but knowing the story, you're seeing all this thing, and, and you can't help but feel really good about all those shots and all that going on and on. We're seeing all that. So quite frankly, I was getting you know more and more excited as time goes on because I'm seeing the results, you know, a little bit piece at a time. When it was ended, and Jonathan told me that close to the final edit, he said it was almost three hours. I started to be, have the concern about it. But then I got the chance to see you know, a rough cut of it. At, at, uh, I think it was right at three hours to the time. I think you managed to tell a little bit out of it. But it's for me, you know, you look at that and you say, man, I'm not sure what I would cut. So all of us, you know, Chronicle Factory, Dave, Jonathan, myself, we have this movie that we all really like, but now we're going to go to distribution. Now we're, you know, we've been in talks uh, with them before, but now we're going to give it to them. And almost three-hour movie that is a horror movie is not traditional, as you said. You know, it's not a regular movie. So there was some concern there. Jonathan, to his credit, you know, he held his ground. And I say held his ground because it wasn't really an argument at all. It was just going in who said, nope, this has to remain the way it is. We're not going to allow you to edit it, cut it down, change the title, do anything. It is what it is. In a sense, kind of take it or leave it. And they were happy to take it. And so there was some concern going in because, you know, anytime you do something non-traditional, uh, whether people are going to accept it. To their credit, also, they, they accepted it. There was no, there was very little discussion about it even. It was just Yep, it's fine, it's great, let's move on. So that all, you know, those negotiations and all that happened over a couple of days, believe it or not. We were all really happy at the end of that. Well, that's awesome because that's actually pretty rare. Uh, at least, at least now it is because everyone's always asked, you know, wanting something else and wanting to take this out, wanting to make something more appealing. You know, there's let's just say less scenes. They want more of that. They want more action and so forth. But I notice in this film, the communication between each character, the key uh, of these characters, they're not very verbal in their own way. Because they're looking at each other, and there's a lot of moments where these characters are looking at each other, standing in front of each other, but you get the uh, idea of the reaction before, of the moment before it even happens, before they even say anything. You understand that, oh, well, okay, you can tell this character is getting mad, and then they say something to the character or whatever, and you can, or, or maybe there's something going on with them in terms of, like, like let's say they're a drug addict or something, or maybe they had some uh, a bad run-in or something. They don't really say anything, but you can feel it instantly before they actually verbally say something. You obviously get Slew Town. <laughs> and Slew Town being an entire universe, that's sort of the laws of physics of Slew Town. Everyone in Slew Town has some backstory, some history that has negatively affected them. Everybody in Slew Town has something they're hiding, something that they're not really willing to share with everyone, and something typically that, that has sort of negatively affected their something in their past, and so you see that. So, you know, David Lynch comes to mind, both those kinds of feelings. You don't uh, often know what that backstory is. Sometimes they come through. Maybe they'll come through in the next film, if not this one, as to why they are the way they are. But hopefully the way they are is obvious. And again, a lot of non-verbal communication exactly as you said it. But I really enjoyed that portion of this whole film, the whole overall tone of it, because this is a, I think it's a, almost a little bit of a low key in terms of acting wise, but I like it because you, you're you telling the audience right there off the bat, but you don't need to 
always have to be verbal about everything. You don't actually have to be too dramatic about everything. It's usually just right there just by a, a simple gesture or a simple type of feeling that character already has. It's basically transversing that feeling to you. You like you get it before they even speak. It, it takes a lot to, to make that all happen. It starts obviously in the writing, but in the filming and the angles and, and even uh, interpretation, obviously we're just doing a lot of nonverbal stuff. You know, the tendency is to give it more sometimes and you know, the slow burn aspect is less. And everything from the writing to the color at the end builds that town universe, but it is definitely slow burn, and you either get it or you don't get it, <laughs> but you really need to understand that well in order to pull that off as an actor for any part of the film. Oh, definitely, and and the fact is that the, this film you can you can you can follow just basically everybody in this in this film. Uh, Sonia Lutas, she does very well playing this part. Uh, Tabitha Bastian, uh, Tabitha Bastian playing her role. I think in a way, like, she's the most uh, sympathetic character because like it looks like she's trying to be a good person because we instantly feel the kind of um, history that she had and she's kind of wanting to help Sonia's character out in terms of like almost like being a sister to her like that she didn't have because clearly you know Sonia's character is very alone I I, I can definitely feel Tabitha's presence in this and uh, like, like I said that kind of characterization like uh, mixed within this type of film does give a, an interesting angle to to the whole thing to where, where it's going to lead you she was fabulous at the film. As you mentioned, you know, she was one of one of the people in the film that had some emotion. You know, in her case, sympathetic. Yeah, she did a fabulous job. I Sanaya, you know, obviously the protagonist there, she she did she was a bit sympathetic. I thought the part that was interesting to me was that Harvey <laughs> was a little bit sympathetic in both the way I mean obviously completely non verbal, but just in motion and, and you know, I don't want to give Movie, but, but a little bit of sympathetic in there as well. So that was probably the one that, that uh, many didn't expect. Definitely an interesting approach and its outcome, and uh, it's definitely worth checking out. It's definitely, it reminds me a lot like something like Donnie Darko in a way, because th this is one of those movies you kind of, if you're not fully aware of Beloved Beast when you first watch it, you could watch it again, and then you you might really under fully understand the, the second time. It's like <laughs> watching Donnie Darko. I was like, oh, that's what that was. You know, that kind of moment. Oh, that's what that meant. Well, I sure hope so. That's the intent. And, and again, with it being such a, a slow burn film, a lot, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of nonverbal cues. You're looking down at your cell phone when some of these happens when Ash has a moment of empathy uh, about a little girl or is questioning what he's doing or you know, any one of the characters you know, anywhere, you're going to miss it. <laughs> so it's one of those films that with so many low-key, non-verbal things happening, a glimpse at a lineup, uh, you know, maybe you can miss a lot if you're not paying attention. Oh, I definitely agree. You can miss something because if you look away, you go to the bathroom, and you don't hit pause, you're gonna miss something. You're gonna miss. You're gonna probably gonna say, "Well, why she has this or why is she doing?" That? Well, that's because you left the room. You should have paused it. You know. <laughs> would you like to add anything that we haven't covered uh, in this film as of yet? Would you Would you like to add something more to it? The only thing I would say is check out the film. It is a different kind of film. So empty your mind, sit back, relax take some time. If it were me, I'd watch it all in one sitting. You know, take your time with it, make sure you've got the attention span to watch it. But I, I think I can speak for everyone on the film, and certainly Jonathan and Dave, partners in crime, that they're uh, all very proud of it. The other thing I would say is that as we mentioned, the Love of Beast takes place in Sleetown. And Sleetown is uh, an alternate kind of universe where things are kind of the same as they are with where we're at some fairly substantial differences as well and uh, you haven't seen the end of Slew Town. Chances are you've never experienced your life and that's that's the beauty part of this. The Love of Beast is, uh, is, is definitely something you uh, definitely go rent probably multiple times but you guys should check out The Love of Beast either uh, you can check out the trailer on YouTube right now and it's been it's been up there forever but check out that out check the trailer out give it get a good glimpse of this movie you'll see what it, what it is at first probably you're like hmm what's what's that but that's the best part it's supposed to make you wonder what this 
Genesis. So you could check this movie out um, on YouTube, and it's probably floating around what on Amazon and stuff, or, or at least on some online streaming areas right now. Or is it purely uh, in in the movie in the theater at the moment? Yeah, because uh, it'll be in theaters here in the next uh, few weeks. Out on Amazon, on uh, iTunes, um, it's coming to all kinds of. DOD, you're depending on the platform around the world. Check it out. We really hope you like it. Yes, indeed. And everybody, this is Earl Grey, actor that known uh, is in this film, Beloved Beast, and as well as Tall Man. You go check out Tall Man after you watch Beloved Beast because you, if you could put these two movies together, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna have that nice feel to it, but you're gonna have an additional uh, creepy feel to it. And I mean that in a positive way because you're gonna like it. You will. And I offer sneak out.